Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Dermer, the Chief Medical Officer of Sleep Charge by Knox Health. I'm here today to speak with you about telehealth strategies and sleep disordered breathing, workflows, and outcomes. To begin, let's have a little bit of an overview. Um, I want to talk first about telehealth and telemedicine concepts, two things that are very similar in, in nature but actually quite different in practice. And then I'll talk a bit about telehealth approaches to building a consistent sleep disordered, breather care, sleep disordered breathing care program. And uh, third, I'll talk about an example from our own program, Sleep Charge, talking a bit about how we use telehealth as an approach to large populations. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about the outcomes from a telehealth approach uh, for sleep and sleep disordered breathing. So let's start by just talking about te telehealth itself and what exactly telehealth is. And to start with, I just like to have this little image about telehealth as uh, really encompassing all delivery types um, of health and healthcare related services using electronic systems. So medical care really delivered through internet and internet-like communications. Well, as the word telehealth suggests, um, what we're talking about here is more than just medical care. It's also about supportive care, well-being care, things that coaches provide, wellness programs, uh, care navigators, and step care programs that support medical decision-making as well as communication through, again, internet and communication uh, systems. And then finally, adding in uh, devices. This is a big part of telehealth. And devices come in two flavors. One, medical devices. And for the sleep industry, this is home and laboratory sleep testing devices. Um, external and implanted therapeutic devices like CPAP devices or devices that are stimulation devices. Um, also, medical alert uh, devices as well that can be used to um, activate uh, individuals and, and actually uh, even ring up a supportive care coach or wellness program with regard to a, a specific patient's issues. And then on the other side is commercial devices. And this is something that we're seeing more and more of as we have the development of things like Apple Watches and Aura Rings, all different kinds of apps and other wearables that uh, people are starting to use in the space of telehealth. And I mean people in the sense that more patients are starting to use these than doctors. And currently there's quite a lot of debate in medicine about using commercial-based devices, primarily because these devices uh, have different firmware updates that occur on uh, occasional bases. And that changes uh, some of the basic understanding of how the devices work uh, from uh, day to day, week to week, year to year. So a bigger picture of telehealth really is all of these elements, medical care being delivered through internet-based communication systems, uh, supported by well-being and support coaching uh, programs that utilize medical devices for diagnostic care, uh, as well as therapeutic care, and then also commercial devices, which are more and more becoming part of a telehealth strategy uh, to provide people with uh, input to uh, the supportive well-being coaches, but also into the medical care profession as well. So now you have a sense of the larger picture of telehealth and really where telemedicine lives within this space of telehealth is what you see in the diagram here. Telemedicine is when we actually provide direct medical care between a patient and a professional healthcare provider. And so within the circle of telehealth, that really involves the medical care circle and the medical devices circle and the overlap that occurs within that. Again, all connected through the internet, sort of the brick and mortar, <laughs> the bricks being the medical care and medical devices, the mortar being the internet and all the communications uh, that allows that to occur between uh, an individual patient and a professional healthcare provider. Now, to define telemedicine itself is a little more in-depth than what I just indicated with the uh, Venn diagrams. Uh, telemedicine itself has, over the years, delivered through direct medical care, and some indirect care has actually grown into two different distinct types. One called synchronous telemedicine, where you have real-time patient professional interaction, and this can be from a clinic to another clinic to provide specialty care in some cases, like stroke care, um, from clinic to home where a physician is uh, originating the visit from the clinic but speaking to somebody in their home, 
Um, or as in we've seen more recently with COVID-19 and a lot of physicians working on the internet, a lot of home-to-home -home care with real-time patient professional FaceTime. Um, the other style of uh, telemedicine is really where I think telemedicine started, which is the asynchronous uh, version where you store information about a patient uh, that was collected at a different time and then forward it for uh, view and for uh, interpretation by a physician, for instance, like a sleep study, um, as well as remote data monitoring, which is another entire area of telemedicine that's grown quite a lot in just the last year with a lot of our uh, home-based uh, telemedicine. And these things can involve things as simple as data collection from a PAP device where you're using a card or a cloud-based service to actually get that data and then interpret it over the course of time, uh, which is more of the store and forward concept. But also could be data monitoring in the case of a cloud-based system where you can get real-time sort of night-to-night -night data. Uh, as well as medical questions and historical data collection that can be done ahead of a, a visit with a physician uh, and then forwarded for the review of a doctor. Um, this includes also sleep testing, including even accelerometry. So things like uh, home sleep apnea testing with devices, as well as uh, wrist-worn uh, accelerometers for looking at circadian rhythm disorders. And then online treatment programs. And this is a new area that I think we've all seen quite a bit more of recently. Uh, things that involve like online cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, as well as care management programs or disease management programs that are specifically uh, treating uh, diseases with uh, uh, RNs and physicians uh, online. But again, this is all done in a more of an asynchronous manner where data is collected and then uh, stored for um, the actual uh, interpretation by a physician later. And then there's this area that's starting to arrive into the telemedicine space, which I mentioned earlier, the non-medical device data. So Apple has been doing some work with their uh, device with AFib, and uh, the Apple Watch has actually been used in some research studies. Aura rings are being used to detect temperature change in COVID patients. A number of different overlaps now with these commercial devices being used in a more medical sense uh, in an asynchronous store and forward kind of manner. I think we're seeing a lot more of this in research than we're seeing so much in clinical practice. But again, as research uh, becomes part of our clinical practice, that will change uh, in, in our day to day as well. So now that I've kind of described the telehealth and telemedicine differential in a sense, let me talk a little bit about the workflows that help us. Now to define telemedicine itself is a little. So now that I've kind of described the telehealth and telemedicine differential in a sense, let me talk a little bit about the workflows that help us scale sleep care using telehealth. Um, so in programs where all people who have sleep issues uh, need to be assessed for their, their sleep problems, um, using the technology of what we now know to be sort of the consumer electronics, which is apps, uh, we can easily assess people for whatever sleep problem they have wherever they live. And this allows us to actually quickly uh, provide people a clinically valid way to understand their sleep in ways that we can even interject personalized guidance through individualized sleep care coordinators uh, to help people understand things as simple as their sleep duration, sleep timing, sleep quality, things that we all know in sleep medicine are very uh, basic, but also are very informative. And, and then adding to that workflow uh, the addition of, of information, giving people evidence-based sleeps and circadian rhythm education um, that even can provide them uh, with documents and information that can go more in depth into to the literature to learn more about their own sleep conditions and the addition of uh, sleep health, health uh, behavioral programs, things like mindfulness programs that can be added in uh, to the, the general workflow allows people not only to start to understand their problems, but also to give themselves some self-help abil ability to remedy them. And again, if we're able to then utilize this technology in large populations, we can also individualize it with care coordination so that 
as you're as a participant going through this, you could actually uh, be uh, calling up someone for some more advice or finding out that perhaps you might have a sleep disorder and you want to know more and you want to get more care. And that's where we actually take the people from telehealth workflows and put them into a telemedicine workflow. And here you see exactly what we're talking about when I talk about a telemedicine workflow within a telehealth program. When people come in to see a doctor and they start that journey uh, with a consultation, uh, it's either uh, something that's done over the internet or through an app, but provides that one-to-one uh, -one synchronous uh, experience. It's, it's possible for the doctor to then quickly move people down pathways for their care. And within sleep medicine, uh, we do this with a number of different conditions and different uh, uh, categories of sleep problems. And then as uh, the doctors are making these assessments, they also have at their fingertips the ability to, to do testing now in the home. Different kinds of sleep testing, as well as uh, the home sleep apnea test, we now have portable polysomnography with things like the Knox Health A1. And e-cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, as well as medical therapies and device therapies that can all be uh, utilized from the home directly through a, uh, an integrated telemedicine workflow. Uh, and the most important part of this is not that we can do these things and coordinate them for medical care, but that once people are in care, that they actually get outcomes and they see on a day-to-day -day basis through something like an app uh, how well they're doing with their therapy. Um, and connecting back to actual care management folks and medical management folks that are professionals that are in that sort of blue circle in the telehealth that we mentioned earlier, the supportive care. Uh, these are, are really adding to our medical care and extending our medical care by providing on the moment, on demand needed uh, interjection into the care pathway. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in the next couple of slides. But that's something that I think is what really makes telemedicine work well in combination with telehealth is utilizing these supportive care mechanisms with devices that are collecting data on a night to night basis uh, from afar. Now, interestingly, when people go through a telemedicine based telehealth program for something like sleep disorder breathing, what we find is actually pretty surprising to some, but not to many clinicians that there's a heck of a lot more than apnea that we're actually dealing with. And if you just look at the average uh, outcomes of our own program at Sleep Charge, which we have probably over six to 7,000 people now in care, in the sleep disorder breathing program, when folks come in with that as their main issue, what we find is that it's not just apnea. The diagnoses of apnea only are only about 20% of people, but we also have a lot of insomnia diagnoses overlapping insomnia and apnea, as well as uh, overlapping with other diagnoses like hypersomnolence and circadian rhythm disorders. So it's not surprising <clears throat> that when you look at the treatments we render, um, fully half of the people end up with apnea care, but then another half of people are getting insomnia care with a third also getting some other kind of care for other issues uh, related to, to sleepiness or, uh, or circadian rhythm disorders or even parasomnias that we, that we see occasionally. Uh, it's important to recognize this because when you implement a program specifically for something like sleep disordered breathing, you're getting much more than, as we say, the AHI, you're getting sleep issues. And that's what having an integrated support mechanism around your telemedicine program really provides. So I mentioned the supportive care for sleep in my last slide there. And what I want to explain a little bit more in detail is that this is actually an area uh, where expertise in behavioral sleep medicine and some clinical support uh, with psychologists, even advanced practice nurse practitioners, social workers, medical assistants, a number of different individuals with sleep and sleep <clears throat> associated backgrounds can be significantly helpful for you, you and your practice. And this is part of the telehealth strategy uh, for supporting the telemedicine activities. So using technology uh, itself, it means that you need people who are trained in technology. They need to understand what are the devices we're using for remote monitoring, what um, exactly am I measuring, and what are the things that my system is going to alert me to 
Um, and, and that's a big part of the training. Of course, everyone has a background from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, continuing education, behavioral sleep medicine training. We even have board registered uh, polysomnographic technologists on, uh, on staff doing this kind of care. Um, but what it really comes down to is they're providing care in an escalation-based system. And let me explain a little bit more about what I mean. So the first part of what I just said was uh, escalation, but the second part was system. Let's talk about the system first. The telehealth-based programming uh, that we have in, involving uh, our sleep charge program allows us to create uh, data fields from the devices, the PAP devices that are being used, as well as other types of uh, care like online CBTI programs where people are interacting with their therapy every single night and that data comes back through uh, wireless signals throughout the country uh, to our platform. And our platform has a number of uh, machine learning algorithms that allow us to feed the data back to our uh, teams, our medical management and behavioral management teams in such a way that when there's an issue that uh, activates an, an algorithm, there is a task that goes directly to an individual. And this is just an example of how those sleep management systems provide data in a very visual way so that we can quickly get to the bottom of an issue for an individual. Um, and, and this is something that can be utilized uh, not just from you know, cards and chips and online uh, programs that are available from uh, some of the PAP device uh, manufacturers, but these are actually platform-based systems that we've developed uh, within the Sleep Charge program for all different sleep disorders. Uh, and this is just an example of how we utilize it uh, for sleep apnea. Now, the so what moment of all of this data collection from our management program is what do we do with it? And actually, that's the best part of this, that exception-based management is really how telehealth uh, renders a, a great outcome. And it also escalates issues to the right level of care so that our physicians aren't doing things that uh, our medical assistants could do or our respiratory therapists could do. And we basically take the data from our system, uh, escalate the issues from the system to our care management team that have interactions through secure messaging and they do continuous education around different issues if they're recurrent. And that allows them to actually determine if hey, this person needs to go talk back to the doctor. I need them to see the respiratory therapist to adjust their therapy uh, or even see a psychologist for a problem that's ongoing within uh, their online CBTI care. So remote data capture is one part of this and the management system uh, providing that data back to us is another, but exception-based care is really how we escalate things in a stepwise fashion uh, that really creates outcomes. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Now, before I jump into talking a bit about outcomes, which is going to be the, the very end of our talk today, I just wanted to just show you a little bit of the complexity behind the scenes. And uh, I'm sure my uh, technology development team is probably rolling over in their grave that I'm showing their work. But um, this is just a very small example of how we even just put somebody on a schedule uh, and how we coordinate that through the app directly into our telemedicine scheduling program. So integrating these telehealth elements like apps and online scheduling tools directly with your sleep-based uh, telemedicine program is part of the, uh, of the job of your development team and uh, creating a seamless environment and one that actually is interesting and engaging, that is very difficult. And we have uh, such a wonderful group of people doing that, that uh, it makes it seem easy, but it really isn't. And uh, again, just wanted to show you something that looked a little more complex to give you a sense that it's not as simple as all the nice little circles that I get to show as the doctor. Now, I just have a couple more slides left and uh, just a little bit of time left too. So let me quickly give you some sense of what happens when we do things like this in the Sleep Charge program and put all this effort into creating workflows uh, that connect our telehealth and telemedicine programs. Well, one of the things that happens is we get compliance for PAP therapy, like 90 to 95% of people, 6.3 to 6.4 hours of sleep per night and 6.7 days per week. So 
outrageously high levels of compliance and adherence to therapy because of the individualized program, uh, because of the care management, the medical management, the escalations, the engaging tools that our, uh, our telemedicine um, uh, technology development team has developed. And this is what actually happens when people stay in care as they do in our program year after year after year. You see changes in things like health. And, and here's just some health outcomes that we, have, we track on all of our members using uh, health claims analytics. And we show here a cohort of people with hypertension in green that are not in our program in this one large population with a co cohort that's matched to our sleep charge participants also with hypertension. And you'll see that the change in the cost of their care from their health claims analytics goes down significantly in the first year and it maintains a lower level uh, on the outcome years. And we believe this is uh, directly related to treating their sleep apnea as nothing else really in these cohort analyses uh, changes for these individuals other than uh, providing care for their sleep disordered breathing. Now, if we look at the actual cost of total care for individuals in our program versus matched cohorts uh, in our analyses, we see other striking trends, and, and this is just related to sleep disorder breathing care. In the green, you see the cohort with about 6,945 people, and our sleep charge participants, 551. Again, matched directly with these cohorts uh, that are age, gender, um, and even uh, different sleep disorders, and also different um, medical conditions and cost quartiles within the claims data sets are all matched in the beginning. As you see, they were basically the same in 2016, but the divergence of the two um, graphs clearly indicate that when we take care of sleep, and here sleep disorder breathing care is what we're managing, but again, with all the other things around it, like insomnia and, and circadian rhythm issues or, or problems with shift work, once we manage that, we see that the cost of care overall for all the conditions that these folks are being treated for in their medical claims are significantly less over a two-year period with only a 7% increase in that two-year period compared to an 18% increase in a matched cohort within the same population. So I have to say one of the things that I find most rewarding as the Chief Medical Officer of Sleep Charge is that not only are we bending the healthcare costs curves and, and we're actually improving people's health and we can show this through claims analytics, we also do direct management-based uh, uh, research directly in these populations. And we use things like the SF36, SF12, we use a number of uh, health scales as well as productivity scales and even do uh, analyses with companies related to workplace errors and productivity issues as well as safety. And what we see are these rem remarkable changes in just a three month period that maintain themselves for years. Things like vitality measured on SF36 going up overall in the individual groups that are being treated. Uh, people feeling healthier as well by 50%. Uh, productivity levels in the workplace increasing by 25% as measured by companies themselves, as well as 40 plus percent less work errors. And we're talking about errors that create significant costs within companies, as well as safety issues for individuals in the workplace. So what we're really looking at here is that telehealth and uh, a telemedicine approach to providing sleep disorder breathing care has broad uh, proof points for its impact in not only in getting people to use their therapy, but in the downstream outcomes related to healthy sleep. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention today and um, your thoughtfulness and, and ideas. If you have any questions or would like to contact me, I am available through the Sleep Charge website, as well as uh, I am available, of course, anytime through uh, the ASM uh, virtual sleep uh, program too. So um, I look forward to talking with you about the future of sleep medicine, it's telemedicine and telehealth strategies. Uh, and how we might benefit from uh, this new relationship we have with technology. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Virtual Sleep 2020 Congress, covering a real digital topic. My name is Christoph Schöbel. I'm professor for sleep medicine with focus on telemedicine in Essen, Germany. I'm going to talk about apps, 
E and M health in sleep medicine. I would like to give you some food for thought whether these new developments could even represent an alternative to the way we are handling patients in our daily routine. For sure, there are big chances and opportunities by integrating new digital tools in medicine. But are these just unrealistic fantasies that cannot be implemented in everyday clinical practice? Well, let us talk about the current challenges in sleep medicine and have a look whether and how digital tools could support us. We know from current surveys that sleep disorders have very high prevalence rates. A current survey by a German health insurance company shows that up to 80% of those surveyed complain of bad sleep, leading to the headline, tired Germany. Hopefully, you are currently a little more alert than most Germans. Sleep disorder breathing in particular show high prevalence rates in current epidemiological studies. This was shown in many countries throughout the world. Of course, this cannot mean that everyone has to be treated immediately, but we are facing a great challenge. There are only a few sleep medical practitioners compared to the high number of potential patients, mouse versus elephant. This supply deficit is not only evident in Germany, but worldwide. In this scenario, digital tools may help us. Especially telemonitoring of positive airway pressure devices has evolved in the last years. In the current COVID pandemic, more video consultations are carried out in order to be able to continue caring for high-risk patients in particular. New home-based sensors also enable a better management of patients with chronic diseases such as heart failure. But how to implement this in sleep medicine? Well, in 2017, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine published a sleep telemedicine implementation guide to outline how telemedicine could be used in everyday sleep medical practice. Regarding telemedicine and sleep disordered breathing, studies could show that telemedical management could lead to significantly improved compliance rates with lower termination rates over time. By adding digital engagement tools like apps, patients could participate in their therapies, leading to even higher compliance rates, better to say, a real adherence. But telemedicine is offering also new opportunities for scientific work. By using big data analysis, we are now able to get a deeper look into patterns, for instance, of usage behavior. Patterns depending on known variables, but also patterns we would never have thought about. But let us have now a look into the future of sleep lab medicine. We all know that with the best will in the world, we cannot mimic the usual sleeping environment of patients in our sleep labs. Smart sensors could enable sleep monitoring in patients' own beds and that with only minimal contact or even completely contactless. Contactless home-based sleep monitoring can be done by using radar waves reflected on the sleeping body. Body movements such as breathing can be deduced from the transit time differences of the reflected waves. By using such a contactless device, we can study the severity grade of sleep disorder breathing over a time span of more than only a single night. As showed in patients with chronic heart failure, there are patients showing no relevant sleep apnea over the time, as you can see in the upper row. In contrast, if you look at the graphics below, there are patients with persistently elevated apnea hypopnea index over the entire investigation period over months. As you can see in the middle, the majority of the heart failure patients showed highly varying AHI values, nights without relevant sleep apnea 
alternated with nights with relevant sleep apnea. Interestingly, in those patients, an increasing value was supposed to be linked with deterioration of heart failure signs. This even opens up opportunities to use such a tool not only to diagnose sleep apnea, but to monitor vital parameters during sleep in order to improve a chronic disease management. Recently, it could be shown that those dynamics of sleep apnea in patients with atrial fibrillation could even be linked to the time spent in AFib the next day. On the top, you clearly see in an example patient the varying values of respiratory disturbances over many nights detected by an implantable cardiac pacemaker using impedance-based methods. Having a look below, you see that after nights with no relevant sleep apnea, the patients spend less time in atrial fibrillation compared to days after nights with relevant sleep apnea. Even if there are currently many E and M health devices on the market that allow our sleep to be tracked every night, very few of them are certified as medical products. This means that we cannot rely on whether they are really measuring what they claim to measure. Thus, we cannot use most of the data clinically. However, the more of these tools are validated as medical devices, the more they could support us in our medical decisions. Especially sleep apps may have potentials to face the aforementioned challenge regarding the large number of people with poor sleep. The recently ratified German Digital Supply Act herefore addresses the potential of health apps that have been certified as medical devices. According to this law, German Federal Ministry of Health is setting new standards to transfer digital medicine into everyday healthcare. Thus, Germany will be the first country in the world to prescribe apps as a medical treatment paid by the statutory health insurances. To certify health apps as so-called digital health applications, a legal admission process has been introduced. German Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices will be responsible for this process. It will evaluate whether a health app is able to show positive supply effects in clinical studies. This is the prerequisite to be included in the list and to be reimbursed as app on prescription. Of course, digital medicine does not only consist of isolated solutions, but must be considered more integrative in the future. Therefore, E and M health data must be merged with clinical data in order to bring the greatest benefits to our patients. Our patients should remain the focus of our efforts and also must remain owner of their data. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Now you can wake up again. Bye bye. Welcome and thank you for attending my presentation. This is a discussion about new diagnostic paradigms for us to consider. I thought this cartoon was very appropriate because this, this discussion is an exercise in thinking outside the box, uh, while the reference to thinking outside the bubble is an acknowledgement that the COVID pandemic has inspired and even accelerated our progress towards moving in new directions. Uh, my presentation is in three basic sections. First, I'll discuss some smaller changes for us to consider based around the notion that the HSAT is actually superior to PSG for diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea. Secondly, we'll discuss bigger changes to consider that support the role of wearables um, and changes uh, to how we consider polysomnography testing. And thirdly, uh, we'll discuss really big changes, namely the possibility that artificial intelligence could make our current approach to sleep studies unrecognizable. 
The first change I'm going to propose is to the notion that HSAT studies that are negative requires a follow-up confirmatory PSG, or in other words, from the, from the mouth of a very wise man, uh, it can be asked this way, can a negative HSAT be considered diagnostic for no OSA? This is a study that was part of about a, dec uh, a decade ago. Uh, simultaneous PSG and HSAT were performed on research subjects. Uh, and the data, along with the patient's clinical history, were then provided to sleep research clinicians. Our job was to then review the data and uh, make a determination of what the most likely pri primary diagnosis uh, should be for any given patient. What we found is that sleep clinicians had significant disagreements for the diagnosis, even when presented with the gold standard data from PSG and clinical data. The agreement was high when the respiratory event index was elevated um, and lower when the index uh, was in the mild to moderate range. It's pretty understandable when the AHI is elevated, it gives us an extra degree of confidence uh, that the patient has obstructive sleep apnea. Um, however, what we found is that in all three categories of uh, sleep apnea severity, uh, the agreement was very similar, regardless of whether it, we uh, use the PSG data or the HSAT data. So the study conclusion was this, that variability in clinical decision-making is not significantly related to the type of study performed, but related to variability in clinical judgment. Here's another study that asked the following question, how often is a negative PSG followed by a positive HSAT? In this study, there was 141 patients, and the researchers looked to see how often after this negative PSG was there a positive HSAT, and they found that 84% of the time, the HSAT ended up being positive. 20% of the time, the patients ended up having moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Now, this was a retrospective, non-controlled study, but it does beg the question that in a real world scenario, when you have a negative HSAT and the subsequent PSG ends up being positive, that very possibly it has nothing to do with the superior, superiority of the PSG over HSAT, but rather you're doing a second test and therefore giving the patient another chance of being positive. We performed a study in which there were nearly 100 subjects that were uh, that referred for suspected obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, these subjects were asked to wear uh, three home sleep apnea testing devices that represent different types of HSAT technologies simultaneously for, th uh, for two nights at home. On the third night, the patients or the subjects were asked to wear the same three devices, but this time simultaneously with PSG. Um, most of the studies were auto-scored and the PSG was manually scored. On the left side, you see a picture of me, uh, and this is an example of how ridiculous it looks uh, to be wearing three uh, home sleep apnea testing devices at the same time. Over on the right side um, are the demographics um, and the baseline data for the subjects in our study, and it's pretty typical for a population of patients with uh, suspected obstructive sleep apnea. Here are the results. On the left side is a comparison of the REI 4% and the AHI 4% from polysomnography. Uh, and you can see that for all three devices, the uh, agreement uh, between um, the HSAT devices and PSG um, really is quite outstanding. For the NOx, the R value is 0 0.98. On the right side, uh, even if we end up changing the scoring criteria to the REI 3% versus AASM, uh, scoring criteria, you can see that the agreement still remains uh, really quite outstanding. Um, and for the NOx, uh, actually for both devices that we looked at, the R value remains uh, 0 0.97. Another way of presenting the data, I'd like you to uh, 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 focus your attention on the middle uh, green section on top, uh, which is the NOx T3 device. You can see that the positive and negative predictive values are quite good. Uh, they're all above 80%, 80 uh, and in fact, above 90% uh, as it relates to identifying patients with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. On the bottom, the, under, the area under the curve uh, value is really quite outstanding for all three devices uh, with a value of 0 .9, 0 0.98. One concern uh, related to the use of home sleep apnea testing devices is that it 
um, the AHI is thought to be potentially inaccurate in patients who are poor sleepers. The reason for this is because HSAT devices traditionally um, look at or calculate the AHI based on the number of events per hour of recording rather than per hour of sleep. Um, we identified the patients who were considered to be poor sleepers that had a mean uh, sleep efficiency of about 58%. Um, and what we found is that the uh, agreement between um, the HSAT and the PSG um, uh, technologies uh, still remain quite good with our values of above uh, 0.9. Uh, the reason for this, uh, we believe, compared to uh, older technology, is that the new HSAT devices all use uh, estimated sleep time as the numerator, I'm sorry, as the denominator, and therefore may mitigate uh, the concerns in regards to accuracy in patients who are poor sleepers. Based on the older technology uh, that used uh, number of events per hour of recording rather than per hour of sleep, um, that uh, would lead to a um, uh, underestimate of the true AHI um, and an underdiagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. We took uh, our patients from this particular study, and this is uh, looking at just uh, night three, and, and therefore we have PSG and HSAT results uh, simultaneously. We looked at the diagnostic rates, um, and the diagnostic rate for identifying obstructive sleep apnea uh, based on PSG uh, data is the one that's represented in the orange on the right side. And you can see that 71% of the studies ended up being positive for obstructive sleep apnea. The key finding from this particular graph is that uh, all three HSAT devices had higher diagnostic rates compared to PSG. On the rightmost graph, uh, this is now taking into account uh, uh, three nights of HSAT data. And um, as would be expected, uh, if we take uh, three nights of HSAT data and take the highest value, the diagnostic rates go even higher. Why is this the case? Why would HSAT actually have a higher sensitivity, potentially, of identifying obstructive sleep apnea than PSG? When we took a, a deeper dive into many of these studies, um, this is a pattern that we frequently found. Take, for example, on top, uh, this is a uh, 30-second EEG uh, window, and the first 40% uh, of this window indicates sleep. The second 60% uh, of the window, however, represents a uh, wake EEG, and therefore uh, this 30-second uh, epic would be scored as wake. Now, this 30-second epic corresponds uh, to the middle section of the airflow pattern on the bottom, and you can see that there is a hypopnea here um, that, uh, that uh, occurs during this 30-second uh, this window, but because on the PSG, um, the EPIC is scored as wake and therefore the hypopnea is not counted. Um, uh, whereas uh, on an HSAT uh, recording, the hypopnea would be counted. So we come back to this wise man who asked the question, can a negative HSAT be considered diagnostic for no OSA? And we believe emphatically that the answer to this question is yes, we can. So far, we pro provided support for why the HSAT should be considered to be at least as good as polysomnography uh, based on the accuracy or the agreement between the REI and the AHI. We'd like to proceed with uh, trying to make an argument uh, why HSAT perhaps should be considered superior to PSG for the diagnosis of OSA. And the key reason for this is the ability to capture uh, and take into account night-to-night -night variability. This is a graph uh, looking at the variability of the AHI or REI from three nights of um, HSAT testing. Um, on the x-axis, you can see that this is the night one AHI, and on that y-axis is the difference between the highest value of AHI or REI from nights two and night three uh, for any given patient compared to night one. And you can see here that on certain, uh, in certain patients, the change in AHI value compared to night one um, is uh, at times uh, as high as 60. Even in the low AHI range where on night one an AHI could be five, on night two or night three, it could increase as high as 36. 
the average or mean uh, uh, difference in the highest value of AHI compared to night one uh, was a difference of, of about 11, which is quite substantial. That variability was seen uh, using three nights of HSAT data, and one might ask uh, whether the same kind of variability would be seen if we used PSG data. This is a study in which two nights of PSG were performed, and the Bland-Altman plot on the left side uh, of this uh, slide uh, would reveal to you uh, that there is also quite a bit of variability, actually pretty substantial variability, um, in the AHI from night two compared to night one. In fact, um, you, you can see that about 33% uh, about, uh, of patients had a change in AHI um, of at least uh, 10, um, and about 10% of uh, patients had a change in AHI of at least 15. We wanted to apply this principle that uh, multi-night testing would better be able to capture night-to-night -night variability uh, to real-world protocols. So what we did was we took all the patients in our, our research study that had a night one HSAT that was negative, or in other words, the REI was less than five, and then we wanted to compare the diagnostic rate for OSA if we use the HSAT data or if we use the PSG data. Let me direct your attention to the middle here, which represents the data from the NOx uh, uh, T3 data. And you can see that in the black uh, column on the right side, when we use PSG, PSG data, 13% of the time, the patient ended up being positive for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, if we took the NOx T3 data, however, the diagnostic rate was significantly higher. If we only took one night into consideration, um, which was uh, night three and the same night that we performed the PSG, um, the diagnostic uh, positivity rate uh, was much higher at 31%. And if we took the highest value between nights two and night three, the diagnostic rate is even higher. Now, this is for the NOx T3 data, but if we take a look at the WatchPath data and the ARIES data, a similar pattern um, uh, also emerges. So here are the takeaways in regards to kind of the smaller changes and how we perhaps could reconsider um, approaches to sleep apnea diagnosis. First of all, we believe that negative HSAT studies should be considered to be uh, diagnostic uh, without uh, the need for a follow-up polysomnography test. Um, secondly, uh, negative HSAT studies in those with a high pretest probability, instead of, again, having a, uh, a follow-up PSG, um, we believe that it's actually better uh, to repeat a two-night HSAT rather than PSG in order to better capture night-to-night -night variability. Finally, perhaps we need to consider that multi-night testing with HSAT should be considered to be standard for all patients undergoing uh, a, a, an evaluation for obstructive sleep apnea. So those were the smaller, more incremental changes that uh, you know, we think should be under consideration. Now I'm going to be speaking more about some of the bigger changes, some of which we've actually already applied in our own sleep center. We believe that the real problem is not whether we need to perform an HSAT or PSG and which technology is better. We believe that the real problem is just the inherent unreliability and variability in the primary metric that we use, the apnea hypopnea index. Uh, Dr. Vishesh Kapoor, who is quite the thought leader in our field, um, had this to say, why a single index to measure sleep apnea is not enough. One of the ways that we've gotten around uh, this uh, in our center, and this was largely in response to uh, the COVID pandemic hitting, is that we switched uh, to making obstructive sleep apnea into a clinical diagnosis rather than having it essentially completely be dependent upon a sleep test and producing a metric uh, that would fall into the proper range that we would consider to be positive for obstructive sleep apnea. So what do I mean uh, by OSA should be a clinical diagnosis? And what I'd like to do is to take asthma as, um, a, uh, as an example. So patient number one on the left side has an abnormal spirometry. It demonstrates an obstructive ventilatory defect that responds and improves uh, with application of bronchodilators. This is a patient whose uh, spirometry is quite supportive for a diagnosis of asthma. 
Patient number two, on the other hand, has a completely normal spirometry, however, coughs uh, with exercise, and the uh, coughing with exercise improves with application of bronchodilators. This is a patient that we clinically would, again, make a diagnosis of asthma. In a very similar uh, fashion, um, let's take a look at the right side. Patient number one has an AHI of, a fi of 50 from um, a sleep study, and this is pretty much a no-brainer. The patient has severe obstructive sleep apnea. However, patient number two, who has an AHI of 4.99999 repeated, uh, technically has no obstructive sleep apnea, but snores, wakes up gasping, is sleepy, and the symptoms improved with uh, PAP therapy. This is a patient who I think we would all uh, reasonably consider to be appropriate for a diagnosis of OSA. So we believe that uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating suspected obstructive sleep apnea and performing um, an appropriate test, we believe that there should be a pretty significant shift from the use of polysomnography to home sleep apnea testing. In fact, in our center and, and throughout Kaiser Permanente, um, about 85% of sleep studies are HSATs and about 15% are PSGs. The PSGs we pretty much reserve for much more complicated cases, especially those with complex breathing disorders. However, one of the conclusions that we can make if we shift towards a clinical diagnosis and taking into consideration that there is just such incredible variability in the AHI, including a quite substantial night-to-night -night variability, is that we've actually made the shift towards the consideration of using wearables um, to uh, make or help us support the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. There are companies like Fitbit and Samsung, Samsung Watch, uh, that is developing their algorithms for obstructive sleep apnea identification. Uh, we believe that oximetry-based wearables are probably the most appropriate type of wearables uh, to support uh, a, a, a diagnosis and to better, in order to properly phenotype uh, obstructive sleep apnea severity. Uh, one such device would be like the circle ring from Body Metrics, which is able to measure oximetry, sleep, uh, activity, heart rate, and so forth. Um, of course, uh, again, you know, one of the key advantages of being able to use wearables like this is the multi-night testing. And not only can you test for three nights, but you can test for an indefinite number of nights if necessary. Because of the multi-night testing capability, it also allows for a follow-up assessment. So now we uh, are able to uh, not only capture data in regards to um, the baseline sleep apnea and sleep apnea severity, but now uh, we can capture how that data and oximetry changes, and perhaps even sleep and activity changes um, after initiation of therapy such as uh, CPAP. This uh, may be uh, informative for us to make sure to, uh, to um, test um, and to confirm efficacy to therapy, and it could also be information that can further engage patients with their therapy by demonstrating the, the improvement um, after application of therapy. Now, this is not to say that we somehow believe that there is no role for PSG. Uh, in fact, we believe that PSG is very, very important. Um, and the, the key for us is to identify the proper patients and allocate them to the proper uh, testing modality. Uh, in response to COVID, one of the things that we have done, however, is um, we have um, expanded our spectrum of testing. So. Uh, Instead of uh, doing PSGs for all of our patients, we've actually implemented now, or in the process of implementing home PSG or a type two study using the Knox A1 uh, device. Uh, we are allocating our non-respiratory failure patients to type two testing while reserving attended polysomnography for those with uh, respiratory failure. Um, in, uh, you can see that uh, we're still applying the general principle um, that most testing is being downshifted uh, from PSG to home PSG, uh, from PSG uh, to HSAT, um, and emphasizing HSAT as the primary and perhaps best modality for uh, diagnos diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea, and then even using wearables uh, for many of our patients to support a clinical diagnosis of OSA. Much of the inspiration uh, for us to move towards a clinical diagnosis approach and to downshift the intensity of, um, of our testing uh, approaches for the diagnosis of OSA 
um, is based on the unreliability of the apnea hypopnea index. Um, I think it's been pretty well shown that the uh, AHI um, does a poor job of phenotyping patients. Uh, it doesn't do a good job of helping us identify uh, various types of risks of um, different outcomes. Um, it also uh, does a poor job of helping us uh, predict who's going to respond well to non-CPAP therapies and who's going to be a better candidate for things like oral appliance. Um, and therefore, one of the things that, uh, or directions that we would like to move in is to develop new metrics that are more informative of patient phenotypes. Um, this is an example of one uh, that has been proposed. Magda Yunus uh, has developed the odds ratio product uh, in which uh, he's able to take three second windows from uh, EEG, from polysomnography, um, and is able to uh, create more refined measurements of looking at sleep depth. Um, he believes uh, that uh, this may be, um, or this uh, metric may be better um, at uh, looking at more refined measurements of sleep quality and perhaps better inform functional outcomes. Here's another example uh, of another metric that we proposed. Uh, this is certainly not very sophisticated by any means, but we've been able to find some value in developing the apnea hypopnea ratio. Over on the left side um, is, a, uh, is a very a low ratio in which a patient may have an AHI of 30, for example, but they're mostly hypopneas. Um, these patients tend to respond very well to Proven. On the right side, however, uh, the, pa the patients may again have the same AHI, a baseline AHI value of 30, but now in this case, uh, most events are apneas, and we identified or revealed that these patients tend not to respond quite as well to Proven. This is another example. This is a graph with two lines that represents two patients with the same ODI value. For example, they could both have an ODI of 40. However, the distributions of desaturations um, are very different. Um, taking a look at the decay curve of the lower line, um, this is a patient who may have a high ODI value, but most of the uh, desaturations are mild. There's a lot of ODI 3% and 4% and 5%. On the other hand, the patient that's represented by the upper line um, has a lot of a lot more severe uh, desaturation. So um, there's a lot of uh, ODI 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, and even 40%. Um, although unproven, we would guess that this latter patient uh, perhaps may have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. A summary of the bigger changes that we believe should be appropriately considered are as follows. First, we believe that it's appropriate to uh, approach OSA diagnosis by considering it as a clinical diagnosis. This opens up the possibility of being able to use wearables uh, to support the diagnosis and to, in some ways, phenotype uh, the sleep disorder breathing. Um, we also do believe in the downshifting of the intensity of testing and that HSAT may be superior to uh, polysomnography, um, and to also open up the possibility of considering home PSG uh, for patients, especially those patients who require polysomnography but don't have complex breathing disorders. Now I'd like to proceed with talking about perhaps some um, really big changes um, that um, um, may result uh, in the future of making the current way of processing sleep studies uh, completely unrecognizable. A direction that we're moving in is using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to help us develop metrics uh, that can better help inform us of a given patient's cardiovascular risk, neurocognitive impairment, and likelihood of responding to non-CPAP treatments. Um, we have already touched on uh, the work on developing novel metrics. Um, however, those are based on uh, efforts to pre-process uh, data in different ways. Um, using this machine learning uh, type of approach, uh, we would be allowing the computer to um, uh, create metrics for us that better inform us of a given patient's outcome. Um, the data set that we would be looking to integrate into this uh, would be potentially uh, PSG and HSAT metrics. Uh, it could also include or it would also include the raw data uh, from sleep studies as well as complementary non-sleep study data um, and then allowing the computer uh, to be able to then develop metrics 
um, that can be more informative for us and make better decisions or help patients make better, deci make better decisions in regards to their care. Knox Medical has started to do some work in this area. Enza Data is another company whom we're developing a collaboration with that has also done some work in this area. Uh, for example, uh, this is a slide that uh, demonstrates their work in combining PSG data and clinical observation data uh, using that data set and applying machine learning to predict various types of clinical outcomes, including all-cause five-year mortality. I firmly believe that computers are able to see things that the human eye cannot see and is able to process um, all this uh, information from sleep studies in a much faster way uh, than humans can. And therefore, I believe that this era of breaking up uh, sleep studies into 30-second epics and then having a person manually score each of these epics um, is going to be a thing of the past and become antiquated. Um, instead, uh, the time that uh, we're able to save from not having to score studies uh, can be converted to emphasizing follow-up care or care management uh, and really uh, investing the effort into improving clinical outcomes. In conclusion, number one, we believe that the evidence supports much broader use of HSAT over PSG to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea. Number two, we believe that automated intelligent processing of sleep studies will identify more informative uh, sleep disorder phenotypes. And number three, we believe that the more refined phenotypes will help support a clinical diagnostic process that is better able to enhance personalized care decisions. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you for listening. To thank you for listening.